All right. Well, it's 5.59, so I guess I will, I will begin. So um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to, to be here to talk about our draft of our middle school plan. Uh, I'm Dr. Patrick Sullivan. I'm a uh, very proud superintendent of Cohasset Public Schools. And uh, I should say that um, it's, you know, it's great that um, we're even able to talk about the possibility of this. Uh, and of, of bringing back students uh, into a uh, into a hybrid model, you know, clearly everybody wants to bring back students as much as we can. Um, we have to look at what's the safest for our students right at this point. But really, because of the fact that uh, rates are low right now in Cohasset, and we're in a we're in a situation where we're even able to afford this, uh, safety becomes. Um, is the most paramount thing we do. I, I always say that as a superintendent, that is my main job is uh, to keep, make sure everyone's safe, the staff is safe, the students are safe, and to create environments that provide that and provide education. So in times like these, you know, that, that does become a paramount to us. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the purpose of the meeting in a minute, but I wanna make sure I introduce the folks who are with us. So first I have Dr. Leslie Scollins, who is our assistant superintendent. And I have Barbara Sawanka. Barbara Sawanka is our new director of student services, already hitting the ground running, doing a fabulous job. It's not the greatest way to introduce people to, to someone on Zoom, but um, welcome, Barbara. Happy to have you here. And of course, uh, you all know um, John Mills, who's done a just absolute fabulous job in his first year as principal. Although I'm sure, John, if you're, you're feeling like me, probably feels like six years rolled into one at this point. Um, <clears throat> So we're, you know, but we're all here and um, the purpose of the meeting obviously is to gain input into our draft. The draft that we sent out is a draft. Um, it's a draft that had a lot of thought put into it, as you could see. Um, and, but we are here to listen, to try to gain input so that we can uh, create a better product for you. Um, nothing is absolutely set in stone, but we feel right now that this is a plan that uh, we can forge forward with um, confidently. Uh, a little bit about our timeline. We do have forums this week. You know, we, this is our third of four forums. We have a forum uh, on Monday. And um, August 5th, we have a school committee meeting. The school committee meeting will be when the leadership will present the draft roadmap for approval to the school committee. And that will be, of course, pending our COASA Teacher Association negotiations. Um, August 10th, our plan is at this point to draft, uh, or I should say, to send out a final draft to families. At that time, we're going to be, as part of that draft, asking families to let us know if their child or children will be coming to the hybrid model, if that is what we're presenting at that point, um, or if indeed they may be uh, looking to um, have their child do a fully remote option, which we will be presenting. Um, as an option for everyone. And that will be, uh, more on that will be in our final draft as well. And then the idea is that uh, we would want that information by August 17th. And uh, we would make any needed and additional changes at that point. Uh, I should say that our bus routes have, uh, are actually in a better position than they were last night when I talked about them. We're, we're in a position now where we feel we've formulated our bus routes uh, pretty well. We're working with uh, uh, a couple of parents who are experts in this to help us. It's really been a community effort along with our uh, director of finance and operations. But we are in a position this year where we can only offer bus routes based on the restrictions of bus seating, which is one per seat. And in a 73 person bus, it really gives us about 26 uh, students we can sit in the bus. Maybe a little bit more if we, and we are going to be putting family members together on buses. I know in my household that won't sit that well, but um, it is a, for a safety measure, we're able to have those um, family members in the same bus. And uh, we will get those bus routes out to you by no later than August 17th, but I believe they'll be coming out uh, sooner than that. And of course, the sixth grade is part of that bus route. So middle school, the seventh and eighth graders, we will not be able to offer you uh, bus transportation. We have to stick to the law, which says at this point, K to six outside of a two mile radius. New information has come out since I did publish the draft. Uh, that, pub that information includes uh, fall remote learning guidance, 
which we'll be incorporating into our next draft, guidance for courses requiring additional safety information. So that includes physical education classes, band, chorus, theater, um, and what the restrictions and safety measures will be placed around those courses. That'll be in the new draft. And as many of you probably know, the commissioner of education, Jeff Riley, and the Massachusetts Teachers Association came to an agreement, a memorandum of understanding that would allow teachers some additional days before they do meet with students. And that really fits into our phased approach. Uh, it does probably necessitate a calendar shift. I do not actually make the decision on calendar. I'll make the recommendation to school committee and they will make that calendar shift. Um, it, it is set in the, um, in the MOU that we would not be starting beyond September 16th unless we do a, uh, a waiver for that. But you'll be hearing more about that in the coming days. And when I have official word on what that calendar looks like, uh, I will get that out to you. And that will probably be after the school committee meeting on the 5th. And the school committee may have many policy uh, items to, to de deliberate and to vote on, including attendance policy, final policies on masks, um, various safety policies that you saw alive in the, uh, in the draft if you read it. So I should mention that we are currently in negotiations with the CTA. And although there was a lot of input from CTA members in the formulation of the draft, as you can see on the draft, it was a really comprehensive and collaborative effort. Uh, that should not be mistaken as actual negotiations. Uh, we have a unionized workforce, and whenever you do have a unionized workforce, you do have the need to work with them, and it's only right to do so to bargain how, we, how the plan that we put forward create uh, impacts their negotiated responsibilities and working conditions, so those talks are ongoing. So with all that preliminary material out of the way, uh, we will get into the format of the forums. The format of the forums is uh, we will go through a presentation of the plan. It's usually at this time that I thank that middle school principal we have, John Mills, for creating the presentation for us and working with me, but he's right here. So he's actually gonna be able to, to walk through part of his own presentation. And then we'll do a brief, um, brief question, or we'll do a brief overview and then we'll get into questions and answers. Uh, I realize that we're not gonna be able to um, go through every question you have. I mean, there are 86 participants live here on Zoom. I know there are more on Facebook. We'll get to as many as we can, but please uh, send, mess send a, uh, a question to me, or if it's a building specific plan to uh, Principal Mills, and we'll get back to you. Your input is really important, and it's helping us to craft the plan. One uh, last note is that we do have some pretty good funding sources available for us as we move forward, one of which is a school reentry plan, which offers $225 per student uh, in our district. It comes to about $328,000. So we're working on what we can best spend that on. And these forums are timed so that you can help us in addressing that. So it's nice to hear what is important to you and what, what you really, really want to do. So with that, I'm going to switch over to our Prezi and share my screen here. So this is, again, this was created by uh, Principal, Principal Mills. And I'm just gonna walk through some highlights of it and then get into some questions. So in terms of our reentry uh, model, of course, we all want to bring back students in a full person if we can possibly do so. But we were tasked to look at uh, what, what are called pressure tests. And the pressure test by the commissioner asked us to look at desk, uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, the way we set out desks at three foot and six foot distances and to consider a three foot and six foot distance and everything that might happen uh, in a school. With all of that, we determined that we could not safely fit the amount of students we needed to fit in the building um, if we were bringing everyone back at, at really at, at certainly at a six foot distance, but uh, at a three foot distance. We just couldn't fit the bodies in at a six foot distance and three foot distance, it was pushing it. I think Principal Mills will talk about this, but he's done some analysis where um, given his regular schedule, about 50% of the classes would not fit in the rooms, nor could we figure out uh, ways to actually safely have them in the building if we had everyone in. Uh, however, at the hybrid, uh, busing, of course, is another major factor that inhibits the, the return of all students. And I talked about that 
we'd, we'd literally have to double, maybe triple our bus fleet to have everybody be able to come in to a place where we couldn't fit them all safely, given the guidelines we would need to fit them in. But we do feel confident that we could fit them in and present a very uh, productive hybrid model. So of course, we're looking at this hybrid model at both, at both the elementary and at the secondary level. Although we're gonna be talking primarily at the secondary level today, the middle school, I do want you to understand that we did pick these hybrid models based on the needs of the students. And we felt that the, the need for that connectivity between the teacher and the student and the basic skill development uh, needs of our elementary students really required a model that did not allow them to go a full week without being in person, and I mean in person, physically in person, face to face with their teacher. So what we have at the elementary level is we have two cohorts. We have an A cohort who will go Monday and Tuesday in person, and a B cohort who will go Thursday and Friday in person, with a Wednesday in between that will be a uh, remote day for all. And of course, on the days when those cohorts are not in person, they'll be receiving remote learning. And they have a nice model where they're alternating between um, specialists and uh, core teachers running those remote learning. And we're looking at ways at all levels to bolster the synchronous nature of our remote learning model to in increase its robust, its robust uh, uh, cons the, the way it, is, it, it will be um, <clears throat> put out to, to, the, uh, to the public uh, as we go forward. And at the secondary hybrid model, uh, we've decided that a one, the, the one week in-person learning and one week remote learning will be best for our students given the independent nature of the secondary student and the fact that we feel like we can really look at um, creating lessons in a remote mode and units in a remote mode and that we can uh, toggle between uh, times when they're in person and really are working with that um, con connected model in person and then times when we can do some um, reinforcement in a, uh, in, a, in a remote model. All of our school plans include uh, specific safety indicators for the wearing of masks. Um, all students K through, through um, I'm sorry, grade two through grade 12 will be required to wear masks. It's not a suggestion, it's a requirement. And uh, social distancing, we'll be having social distancing, distancing protocols put throughout all of our buildings, um, at least three foot distance. Of course, masks will come with mask breaks. We'll, we can talk about that this more when we get into the questions. But mask breaks are, are required, uh, two mask breaks at every, at every level will do more. The way I'm looking at mask breaks, and we all are, is that there'll be breaks that are prescribed um, for different cohorts and different groupings. Where, where you'll just go and do the break. And then there'll be breaks that are needed based on the fact that you know, there'll be times when our students will need to have a break from a mask and uh, we'll be able to go outside, do that at a proper social distance. And uh, also our cleaning protocols are all sanctioned by the Center for Disease Control and they're all being followed. And we'll have uh, outlines for everything that our cleaners have to do um, based on CDC guidelines. Communication. I talked about this a bit in my intro, but we will be asking um, after we put out our next draft for, and that'll have more information about what our remote learning only model will be, but we'll be asking for parents to let us know if their individual students will be coming back in the model that we're, we're advocating for, or if they're, they're gonna be need to be taught and uh, that for a variety of reasons in that remote learning model. We're asking that people make that decision with the thought that probably they're gonna be in that remote model if they choose it, potentially for the year. However, we do understand that there, there could be flexibility in that, but we really need to get as much of a commitment as we can on that when we ask for that. So without further ado, um, I will go back to um, some of these features as we get into it, but I wanna uh, let Principal Mills kind of walk us through what his building model will be like at Cohasset Middle School. Okay. Oh, thanks very much, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, the, um, the, now we're talking about the hybrid model. Once again, the, the state had asked each district in each building to uh, create plans for remote learning, for hybrid learning, and for fully face-to-face in-person learning. 
like Dr. Sullivan had explained, we looked at the in-person and we didn't believe that we could maintain the guidance uh, uh, around safety, around social distancing. That became impossible. So we're focused on the hybrid and this, this is the hybrid plan now. Our cohort, uh, the, the organization would be, uh, the student body would be divided in half um, alphabetically. Uh, it's worked out to be, it's, it's about A to the middle of the L's and then you know, the next part of the alphabet to Z. Uh, they're gonna rotate on a weekly basis. Uh, so one group, we'll call them group A or cohort A would be in, in person uh, for their learning model while group B simultaneously will be home at the end of the week. For the following week, the two cohorts switch um, and, and alternate between in-person and remote. Uh, this differs obviously than the, from the elementary school, uh, which is a, a, a smaller uh, interval of, of time uh, every two days or two, two and a half days they, they alternate. Our in-person learning component, uh, I took the uh, guidance from our, our working group. Um, our our uh, working group was made of faculty, department chairs, parents, and last month, uh, uh, at the end of remote learning in June, we also met as a faculty and talked about, you know, how would we do this better if we had to do it again? A lot of that informed our approach to how to set up this hybrid model. Uh, one of the very first pieces that we heard is that for students, whether uh, in but really out of school, the remote learning students, they need a, a simpler schedule and one in which uh, there's more predictability. There, are, there aren't as many uh, moving pieces. Traditionally, our schedule consists of 62-minute uh, periods. Uh, kids take seven classes. They rotate. Uh, every day, two classes drop, they don't meet. And we found that during the remote learning, that became a lot for, for kids and teachers to sort of keep up with. So as you see, our schedule is, is flattened out. It's much simpler. Uh, the same classes would occur at the same time every day during the week. This would necessitate a shorter period. They're gonna be 44 minute classes, which we believe would be easier for students who are home in that remote learning model. Uh, we've always had a utility period, but we've always incorporated that with lunch. In this model, we're moving it to the end of the day so that kids can get a jump on their homework. They can go back and get extra help if they're in person. If they're remote, they could reach out to teachers. Um, we've also made the first period a little bit longer because we know um, with more of our students having to drive, uh, it's going to necessitate, you know, there's, there's kids are going to be coming in maybe a little bit later. Um, and, and we've tried to build that in and predict. Uh, and then the strength too of this flattened schedule is it, it still allows our teacher teams to meet regularly and meet every day to coordinate things like homework to make sure that our kids aren't being overwhelmed, but also to integrate the curriculum as much as possible so that uh, you know, a t uh, students ideally would be uh, working maybe on projects that support uh, the, their learning in a couple of classes. Last year, uh, you know, we did our project-based learning in uh, sixth and seventh grade, uh, the boy who harnessed the wind and um, hidden figures. Our teachers have, have already spoken about this, providing them the opportunity to kind of create those learning moments. So we do have time built in for teachers to, to collaborate both with kids and with each other. Okay. Click. There we go. And as I said, uh, half of our kids will be remote learning. The expectation would be that when students are at home remote learning, that they're still going to synchronously access the in-person learning instruction. In other words, they know that their first period class, their math class, starts at 8.15. The expectation is that they would join that teacher's Zoom at 8.15 as if they were walking in from the hallway and sliding into their desk, except it might be a desk or a kitchen table. Um, this, we hope, would really enhance our remote learning students' uh, sense of connectedness to the curriculum, to their teachers, and really to their peers, to their friends. Um, so uh, our teachers will work on, you know, beginning classes with everybody, half of the kids remote, half of the kids in person. 
and that that comes from some of the the feedback that we got about the remote learning experience that students often felt like isolated or, or alienated uh, I think this would once again uh, enhance some of that connect that sense of connectedness yep mm-hmm <laughs> Sorry about that. Now I'm back. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> a, little, a little rough today. Okay, good. Yeah. So how does the model come together? These are some of the details and hopefully it answers some of your questions. Um, the, uh, uh, unlike the remote learning period in the spring where students received credit or no credit, uh, our kids will be assessed unit using our traditional grading scale, A through F, zero to 100. Um, and, and their learning will be assessed that way, whether it's remote or in person. We hope that's going to increase the sense of um, it counting. Uh, very, uh, from a lot, of, a lot of our kids during the remote period, they felt like they weren't sure. It, it, it didn't feel real. It didn't feel like it, quote unquote, counted. Um, our students' learning is, is paramount to us uh, right after their safety. So we are, like the other schools in the district, using a, a traditional grading scale. Um, we're going to work on the instructional model with our teachers so that materials will be available electronically for our remote learning students, just the, the way they would be for our kids in person. Obviously, the exception would be things like textbooks that all students might receive, or maybe a novel that, uh, you know, in, uh, that uh, let's say in ELA, everyone's reading the same book. Kids will still have that as well. As I mentioned, the, this gives teachers the chance to cooperate. Uh, in the event that we do have to go to full remote learning, um, okay, I'm going to go back to any last details. Um, this is the fourth bullet. Students participating in learning remotely are going to be uh, expected to once again uh, follow uh, same behavioral uh, expectations that they would in person. They're going to be expected to log in at the beginning of their classes, attendance will be taken, and, and really conduct will be expected uh, as if they were in class, like appropriate behavior. And we'll, we'll lay out a, a, um, a, a document to parents, an explanation uh, to, to parents and students for what it looks like to be a, a successful middle school student. And what are our expectations behaviorally? What sort of responsibilities should our students be willing and, and, uh, to take and, and certainly to be supported with when they struggle? Um, and, and that's as I speak about like an etiquette, but that's still forthcoming. Uh, our full remote learning model, should we have to switch from a hybrid to a full remote model? Basically, uh, we've talked to the, the teachers about approaching this year, uh, as, you know, assuming that they're gonna have to teach remotely. In other words, don't try to create two or three different lessons. Don't try to create uh, different experiences for different kids. Um, beyond, you know, certainly we differentiate for kids, but, um, you know, be ready to teach remotely and, you know, work with the students who are in front of you. Should we have to go to a full remote learning model based on public health conditions? Um, we want to do so seamlessly and in a way that it is not going to um, create any uh, turmoil or, or confusion for kids. Uh, the schedule is going to be maintained and, and all students, as opposed to just half, would be required to, you know, log into their classes and participate that way. Um, grading would stay the same. Uh, we'd, we'd have uh, additional times where our teachers could be available for um, some sort of help uh, by appointment. And things like our, our counseling services, uh, we've got wonderful school counselors and adjustment counselors. Um, the support that they give our students, that would continue if we were in a full remote learning model, as well as certainly any IEP services that uh, uh, your students are accorded. So we, our goal is to make a switch to a full remote learning model as seamless as possible. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. So a couple, a couple of other things I'd, I'd like to talk about just briefly is, obviously there are safety protocols in all of these areas in the guide and we're adding to them. And as I mentioned, guidance is coming in and we're really gonna be in a position of implementing all of these in August. So um, I'm not gonna get into these now, but you can see masks, social distancing, guidance for lunch, uh, all of these have specific guidance um, elements to them. 
And I talked about the calendar shifting, but the first six weeks, which are essential in any school year, are going to be a paramount, um, really paramount this year. Um, although the dates may change, or the date of the start may change, I, I want to make sure that you understand the goals won't. So the goals are really to establish um, safety and security. And when I say reestablish, what I mean is that every student has experienced some form of trauma, whether, and a lot of students can come in and it won't be a big deal for them. Others, it's going to be harder to, to come back. You know, they've been essentially out of school since March 13th. And we have to take that into mind. Um, they, they're also coming back in an environment that's different. You know, there'll be people wearing masks. There'll be um, a different format for some of the way we've typically done things. And we have to be really mindful of that. And we also have to take these new safety measures and meld them with our current safety measures, just to make sure that the students understand what to do and have the protocols no matter what scenario comes um, their way. Reconnecting with fellow students and former teachers is so important, um, particularly at the middle school level. I was a middle school principal and that, that social development that happens in that time period, I don't have to tell you, is, is just as important, um, if not more so at times, than the academic development. So to connect with their fellow students, to get to know um, their new teachers, and also to have some closure with their former teachers. All of that is going to be really important. Uh, understanding the expectations in both remote learning and in-person learning and how the two will come together. We're going to go over all of that and make sure that our students are ready for it, that our staff is prepared and ready to talk about that. And then we're going to engage in discussions regarding social awareness. This is such an uh, important time in, in, our, in our history in, uh, regarding social awareness and the, the events that have come up regarding human rights. Um, all of that needs to be talked about, the racial un, uh, unrest and injustice happening. And we, we have to look at um, talking about the pandemic um, and, of course, fo focusing on the social emotional learning competencies of self-awareness and self-reflection. That's incredibly important right now as we move students back into our, um, into our school year. Um, we'll get into that too much, but I do want to talk just briefly about our social emotional supports. So Cohasta schools are really joyous places. You know, one of the things that I was so proud of this year is the way that Principal Mills and his team worked with the community to give the middle school its own identity. Uh, it was a wonderful shining moment this year to see that happening and developing. And the increase of student voice, particularly at our secondary level, at our middle and high school, we need to keep that going and, and keep working on that. But as just as importantly, we have to keep that joy. So we have to figure out ways to keep our schools joyous and to keep our, com they're really community schools. I, I can feel that. I, you know, when I came here a couple of years ago, it was the first thing I sensed about Coasset is that these are schools the community cares for deeply and they're part of what, what happens in our schools. And we have to continue that. And then the CASEL plan for reentry, CASEL, for those of you who don't know, is the Collaborative of Academic and Social Emotional Learning. And they put out a plan that all educators should pay attention to as we re-enter our students. And I'm not going to read them, but you can see their main points. And we'll be very much deeply focusing on that as, long, as, as well as our long-range SEL planning. We need to focus in on family resources, giving families the resources uh, to help students through the new learning environments, through everything that they're dealing with. Uh, we want to make sure that before we start school that we're going to be giving you a good sense of what's happening in our schools, uh, whether it's through videos or if we're able to bring people in to see the actual physical environment. It's very important that families feel comfortable and feel safe and secure with where they're leaving their students uh, in this very difficult time. And it's important to have that same approach for our staff and our same approach for students. So we're going to give the staff resources as well. So that's just a bit of an overview of where we are, and hopefully it gives you a sense of what we plan on doing. And now we'd like to hear from you. Here's some of your questions. And the way I'm gonna do this is I'm just gonna go right through the questions and read them. Um, and then if, if it's best for me to answer, I'll answer. If it's best for Principal Mills to do so, we'll turn to Principal Mills. And of course we have Dr. Scollins and uh, Barbara here to, to help with questions that might pertain to their area. Um, so the first question I have here, I'm literally taking them in order and I'm reading them. So that's how I'm going about it. Um, 
Great job, great job last night for the high school Zoom. That's nice. I think I'm a little tongue-tied tonight because of that. I apologize if I'm, I'm finding myself uncharacteristically stumbling. I'm usually not at a loss of words, but I'm doing my best with it. Um, will there be support for those kids that aren't on an IEP but struggle with remote learning? So that's a great question. So one of the things, and I also should say that I'm a parent of four um, school-age children under the age of 11. All right, so um, my, my oldest is actually going with the, the middle school next year. And I can totally relate to the struggle of um, getting your student involved with a remote learning scenario um, when you're trying to do a million other things. And some students really struggle with that format. I, I have um, a couple of those for sure. So we are working on that. We're looking at what kind of um, supports can we provide families and students when our teachers may be doing some face-to-face -face learning, but aren't able to make it as synchronous as possible. Even in the model like uh, Principal Mills uh, is promoting where some of that synchronous work will be happening by filming a teacher live, uh, doing a lesson. We still wanna look for what we can provide in terms of maybe remote learning tutors uh, who would provide some additional support for students and families as they help navigate through remote learning. So yeah, we're very much tied into that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, does anybody else wanna to add to that at all? Uh, I would add, um, besides the, um... Things like tutors, uh, the, the the human capital to to help kids with their academics. Um, you know, I witnessed firsthand during remote learning the frustration that some kids experience when they have to access multiple online uh, resources that their teachers are directing them to, but they're having trouble remembering their different logins and passwords and things like that. Uh, a lot of time can be lost and a lot of frustration uh, can be experienced. So we're also looking into uh, a technology. Um, platform uh, called a single sign-on, a, a way that our kids would be able to log on to, to one place and then from there be able to seamlessly access all the different um, websites and tools and textbooks and things like that that their teachers might direct them to. So we're, right. you know, so the, both the human capital and the, and the tech tools to help kids I think is important. Another thing we're looking at, and this is all we're trying to put together the puzzle with how we can use our funding, is some technology supports for you as well, so that you know you might be able to um, have access to someone who could help walk you through just some of the technology aspects uh, of getting your student all set up. So hopefully that would all help. Uh, next question is, please confirm that parents have the option to opt for 100% remote. So uh, there's a couple other questions here that it, uh, relates to that, but yes, you will. Um, you, the commissioner has asked that all schools uh, allow that. Um, we, will, we will have more information on what that will look like very shortly. If we choose 100% remote to start, if we deem it safe enough down the road, will we have the option to switch to a hybrid model? Conversely, if we choose to start the year going hybrid and switch over, so you can see where this is going. Um, <clears throat> so we do want to plan. And we do want to try to provide a, um, uh, a good answer for how we want to structure it. So we are going to ask people to, with as much assurity as they can, uh, to go forward and to tell us that, you know, this is the model I'm picking and I probably will be staying with this, uh, if at all possible. Having said that, we do realize we have to be nimble and we have to be able to, to um, you know, to, to afford people to switch models if they absolutely need to. So it's not exactly a 100% answer. We'd like you to, to try to commit, but we understand that nothing can be absolute set in stone in this particular format. Uh, has ventilation in the school buildings been considered and addressed? Yes, it's being addressed. Um, we are up to code on all our ventilation. I wanna make clear about that. We're also looking at things like uh, more air conditioning. Air conditioning is a little bit different than HVAC, but the idea of um, what we need to do to make sure the air is is cool and pleasing for our students who have to wear these masks um, in classes. We want to make sure that it's not an additional factor. And there are some safe measures that we're putting in if the heat index gets too hot, too high, to call what, what I'm calling a heat day um, and make it a remote learning experience for our students if it does get to that. So we're very in tune to uh, that need. Can I can I just the um, yeah. because the classroom ventilation piece. Good. The uh, you, when we originally looked at uh, um, trying to squeeze the whole school in, 
it, it was obvious that it, we couldn't do it and maintain you know, a, a three foot buffer or social distance, let alone a six foot. Um, and as Dr. Sullivan had said, it, with the master schedule for this year, it would be about 55% of our classes couldn't run. They just, we, we just wouldn't have any, any place for them. With the hybrid model, we 100% of our, <clears throat> our classes will fit. And most of our classes will be uh, 10 or 12 kids in a classroom that's about 785 square feet. So the um, demand on the ventilation system, which is up to code and uh, up to SNP, uh, is different. It's just going to be far fewer kids present in the classroom. Mm -hmm. The next, thank you, John. The next question is, the lack of busing for some families is a real challenge. Will any consideration be given to families who do not have a parent available to drive students to and from school? Is there a possibility of increasing our bus fleet to allow a greater number of students to access busing? Not all parents are home and able to drive students. Um, yeah, I mean, right now we're doing what we absolutely uh, are, have to do by law. We understand it's, it's, a, it's an inconvenience for some, but we are providing a K to six outside of a two mile radius. In order to accommodate all of our busing needs, we would need to double uh, our, our bus fleet. Um, we, we can look at it, but it's, it's doubtful that we're gonna be able to provide much more in busing. Certainly, you know, it might be a situation where it would be a lottery at best if we were able to provide busing. Um, and I, I'm just not real hopeful that that's gonna be something that we're able to do. I'm just being you know, completely honest. A lot of this is the best of the bad ideas. But um, unfortunately, that's not something that I anticipate being able to do. Um, with utility at the end, so kids can get help, does that mean that they will be able to go to different classrooms to get that help? That would be for you, Principal Mills. Uh, like the utility that we've run in the past, students have that ability. What they what we do is uh, that the teacher teams regulate it, and they they'll usually ask that a student double check with the teacher to make sure that you know, he or she is available during utility, that they acquire a pass. But then to answer your question, yeah, a student could um, go get help from the teacher that maybe the, they're, they need a little help with, that they're struggling with. So that, that would be um, um, within, within the realm. Uh, we also, in an effort to uh, really enhance that sense of team and to make the school feel like a smaller, more welcoming place, at the end of last year or during remote, um, we shuffled some of the teachers' classrooms around. So now the grades are in specific parts of the building. Sixth grade has their area, seventh and eighth have theirs. So it becomes e even a little bit easier when uh, a student is in utility and they're hoping to see their math teacher when their math teacher might be right next door or right across the hall. So um, that, you know, like I said, it's very, very much within the realm. And that's, that's really the idea of that the, the team model that we use at middle school. Will kids doing remote learning be required to show their face when joining classes? Well, so, I mean, we'll set up etiquette for, for Zoom as, you know, you do when you create any Zoom module. I mean, we really want to make sure that our students are fully engaged in the learning. Um, but, you know, we will we'll work that out. And if that's a question more about, um, the fact that students might not want to be seen. You know, there are ways we can put backgrounds up. Uh, there's lots of things we can do. And if it's more that a student is uncomfortable, as I understand that that was something that happened at the middle school, they were more uncomfortable showing themselves. We're, we're going to work through that. You know, we do want students as engaged as possible in person, and that involves you know seeing them. So yeah. that's my hope. And John, I don't know if you had anything different on that. No, not, not, nothing different. I, I find uh, through a lot of this, I, I try to look for the analogous situation in person. And very often in the classroom, um, there are situations that arise based on student need that call for a teacher to maybe uh, step away from some accepted you know, behavioral expectation. Um, as a school, we, we don't wear hats. Um, Sometimes it might be a situation where a student's just more comfortable, either you know all year in a hat or temporarily. Sometimes in class, uh, you've got a student who, um, because of a medical need, might need to get up and use the restroom. And rather than engaging in the the process of asking and signing out, and the the uh, an agreement is is reached between the teachers and the parent and the student for a new protocol and one that allows you know that supports the student's needs. And and I just see. Things like students who might be experiencing some anxiety on Zoom, 
it's an analogous situation. We're happy to work with the student and family and teachers and find something that makes the student successful and, and comfortable. Next question was, thank you, Principal Mills. Are you aware of concerns by the teachers union, CTA, on the synchronous remote access by students at home? Um, well, like I said, we're working through everything and negotiating with the CTA. It wouldn't be proper to really comment on that except for in general. Um, we're gonna work through that and we're, we're confident that um, we'll be able to. What technological upgrades have been made in the middle school to facilitate participation from students who are remote? We're looking at a few things. We're looking at a few um, um, technological means to be able to open up more synchronous learning uh, for folks that would be you know, better than just looking through a teacher's computer, if that's what that means. Anything you can think of, John, that, that maybe that's pertaining to that I'm not thinking of? No, I mean, we've, we've worked uh, you know, really closely with our IT department and we've looked at the, the infrastructure within the building, uh, both for MCAS last year, which didn't end up happening, but um, student, the, the ability for students to access the, the internet uh, within the building is robust and um, infrastructure wise, I think we're in great shape. And if there are particular uh, tech needs, uh, whether apps or hardware for individual students, we're happy to support those as well. Yep. What's the needs. And um, Dr. Scollins, you could talk a little bit about our uh, sharing of Chromes, of course, if that was what it was referencing. Right, so um, just like we did last year, we will be offering Chromebook loans for those that need them. And so if you need it, you just email me at lscollins at coasetk12.org and I'll send you out a form to do that. Um, one of the other things, we're looking at some other devices too, things like document cameras. They do exist in the district, but looking to see what we can um, do to really enhance what we're, you know, what we do with our kids when they're in remote and when they're in the classroom also. So um, we've applied for a tech grant, so we'll see how we do. Yeah, we did. We applied for a, a pretty hefty tech grant, so all that will go into our plan here. When students are in person, will they move from classroom to classroom and have different teachers for you, Principal Wills? Yes, they will. Uh, the, um, the secondary school schedule is too complex to keep one group of kids together all day and have teachers simply move in and out. Um, you, you know, as, as you know, if your student's taking French or Spanish, right away there are different pathways. Our accelerated classes offer the same sort of challenges. So with our small groupings and then working on protocols with the teacher teams that stagger dismissal from the classrooms, we should be able to avoid or maintain social distance. We had also talked about uh, looking at ways so uh, for students to be able to use their locker, but only a couple times during the day. And we're gonna st stagger the um, assignment of lockers so that uh, a student from group A, for instance, when they're standing at their locker, they, the lockers on either side would belong to students in group B or nobody at all. So uh, you would be able to maintain a minimum of three feet uh, when you're at your, your locker. So um, to answer the question, it's a little bit of a long-winded answer, but now our kids will move between uh, classes and, and certainly I want to keep them safe, but uh, you know, for their, at their age, that little bit of movement is still, I think it's still really important and I think we can do it safely. Yeah, and of course, and this is really, uh, I imagine a safety question and we are gonna be making sure that we wipe down desks um, between classes that we have students, uh, we're hoping people bring these small, these small hand sanitizers, the two fluid ounces, we'll have lots of them. Uh, my my uh, kids already have this like decorative things that uh, kids can wear to, to house them like a necklace. But anyway, uh, the idea the idea is that we're going to have students um, hand sanitizing uh, before each class as they go into each class. So uh, we'll we'll have a whole protocol and directionals in the in the hallways of where to walk and where not to walk. Um, so we're we're really thinking of everything we can to make sure that we maintain social distance, but also give them the experience of, uh, of having a full curriculum. Um, <clears throat> next, will it be possible to request a shift in cohorts so that a student in the middle stu school can attend in person on the same bi-monthly schedule as his or her sibling at the high school? Um, yeah, we, right now we, we're not, we're, we're, we're listening, but right now in our draft, we feel like the 
um, division at the high school by grade level is best for scheduling purposes. So it might, be, and then we're, you know, as Principal Mills said, it's more of an alphabetical split at the, um, at the middle school. So we're really probably not going to be able to make many accommodations or if any in that, um, because whatever we decide on will be the way to go. And we want to make sure it's the best educational situation for our students. And we do understand nothing is perfect, but that's kind of where we are right now. Is there a plan for students on the 504 plan? Well, we'll follow the 504 plan. So whatever the 504 plan says, we will follow and we will implement th those um, accommodations as needed. How will tests be taken? This was asked last night too, John. I don't know if you have a thought about tests. Yeah, and, um, you know, in uh, uh, it's certainly as we began the school year last year, we nobody pictured the challenges that teachers and students would face and um, with creativity and um, you know a willingness to experiment uh, we got through remote learning assessments gonna be the same thing um, and of course assessments quizzes tests it depends on the content area it also depends on on the material um, I think uh, you know if I were a classroom teacher I might if I was gonna give out a, a conventional sort of traditional quiz or test, I might plan on doing two versions and, and, and quiz or test my uh, you know, in-person cohort on Friday. And then when the next cohort comes in next week, do theirs face-to-face uh, -face, uh, on Monday. So it's, it's still, you know, the, the, it's still uh, timely for them and it prevents uh, one group from having any kind of advantage. Um, but, but that's, once again, that's trying to create a situation to substitute, you know, into the, you know, the situation that we have now. I think what you're gonna see is what teachers are gonna end up modifying and, and really reforming the way they assess learning. Um, you might see more uh, open-ended essays or, or um, you know, a, uh, for instance, like a writing prompt that, that requires teacher, uh, the students to use uh, the, the content in a creative or novel way. Uh, as opposed to the traditional multiple choice or fill in the blank quiz or test. And, and to be honest, it, it's, it's going to take, you know, some, some learning um, by both our teachers and our students. But I think what we potentially could get to is a, is a higher level of both instruction and learning. And, and I'm really excited about, um, you know, the solutions that our teachers come up with. So it's going to look a little bit different over time. But another think, question about the oh, sorry, John. Another question about the makeup of what uh, classes will be like. Will it will there be separate accelerated and um, college prep, or it's called regular classes here? So. Yeah, we were able to maintain uh, our schedule as it as it runs normally, uh, as far as the courses that we're offering uh, in this hybrid model, having only half of the students uh, in person and the other half remote and alternate. Um, we're maintaining the schedule exactly, uh, you know, as we plan for this year. So our accelerated math and ELA in seventh and eighth will be run. Um, our band uh, courses, our chorus classes, everything is going to be as it has been in the past. With the, with the proper safety accommodations course, yeah. around it. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to say, like, there are some questions maybe I'm not answering exactly right. Like, is the one about the 504, I'm reflecting, and maybe I didn't answer that properly. So if that person wants to email me separately, just so I understand exactly what you were asking, uh, I will be glad to help you with that. And it goes for any of these questions. Uh, nice, thank you for all your hard work. Will there be any sort of orientation for the sixth graders entering middle school since the schedule is different from what they have known? Yeah, we're looking at uh, different options to um, have kids visit the building safely um, uh, before school starts. And then uh, as, as our year begins, it's, it's going to start with um, a couple of, of days with much smaller groups so the teachers and the kids can kind of get used to, um, uh, you know, the new model. I think in the past, the, the, the way we've run a, a sixth grade or incoming sixth grade orientation, we're looking at, at having them modify that and make it safe. But uh, yeah, we very much want our, our, our sixth graders uh, when, when school begins to feel comfortable and, 
and that they that they get what's going on and that it's their school. Yeah, we're going to take measures with everyone to make sure that they feel comfortable with this new format, and that goes for parents. Of course, we always have a special spot in, as a middle school educator for a sixth grader coming in because it's such a change. Um, so we'll we'll look at that. There was a question about protocols. If a, so, can you please review the protocol if a student or a staff member tests positive? What is the protocol for contract tracing and quarantine? Great question. Um, in the in the guide that I sent you, um, actually is a bunch of scenarios. So if you go and you look at that in the um, the guide and you go into the commissioner's guidance, it really walks us through this. Uh, the main thing is that we're working very closely with our health uh, our health officials in town here, and that we are we have um, what we're calling um, sort of. Uh, isolation or sick rooms. We have to come up with a better title than that, by the way, but a place where we can put a student who might have a symptom uh, that may be COVID-like away from a student who might be in because, you know, they fell down in a gym class or something and scraped a knee. So it's really separating those two. Uh, we do, a, you know, a whole protocol for making sure that we have the proper emergency contact to have a, a parent come in and get a student. And then there are protocols that will be put in place working with our health officials um, to put people on uh, a quarantine or um, whatever might be isolation regarding if they have it or don't have it. And then there's the whole process of uh, identifying folks who may have been uh, exposed to something and working with our health official who will do the contact tracing uh, and will do the uh, communication regarding that. So we, there are all of those protocols and literally as I'm looking at it over here, there's you know, protocols for student or staff who test positive for COVID-19, protocol for close contact of student or staff who test positive, student is symptomatic on the bus, student, student is symptomatic at school, staff is symptomatic at home, staff is symptomatic at school, process for multiple cases in a the school. There's, it goes right down the line and we're gonna follow them um, right by the book and make mm -hmm. sure that we have a process for communication and we have a hierarchy and chain of command and we do. We're, um, we're notifying the proper people, uh, all, all keeping as much confidentiality as we can, but making sure we follow all the proper steps uh, and of course following HIPAA rules. Um, what will lunch look like? Will students have assigned seats for lunch? Will they have an opportunity to go outside? And I, just the last part of that, we're gonna take opportunities to go outside when we can. It's not a permanent solution, obviously, because of weather and because of certain conditions and the size of tents we need and all of that, but they are gonna be very important parts of our day. And it's an important part for, for kids to get out anyway. So I think there's a lot of benefit to have with this. And as far as lunch goes, you know, there are, and I'm gonna let Principal Mills cover this one, but there are set guidelines for the way we can set, set students in a lunchroom to make sure they have proper distance and can take off their mask, because obviously they need to do that when they eat. But as a student reminded me, and we had students all through our teams to develop our, our plans, um, when I was talking about really strict guidance around how, she reminded me that, um, she said, Dr. Sullivan, remember that it's a really social time for us when we go to lunch. We wanna be able to you know, have some conversations with our, our classmates. So we're gonna to attend to that as well and figure out really inventive ways to make sure it's a, it's a social experience for them with keeping in that that format. So I'll let Principal Mills talk about the specifics of it though. Yeah, the, yeah. as we did our pressure test for our building, uh, as I mentioned in the classrooms, we also did it for the for the cafeteria. And and um, if we had attempted, if we attempt to have lunch with the current like long tables, if you've been in our cafeteria and you can picture the long rectangular tables and assorted round tables, we would only really be able to get just a, a scant minority of our kids in for lunch and we would have to, you know, it would be extremely disruptive to the school day and run multiple, 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 multiple lunches between the middle school and high school. Um, what we're going to do is we're looking at removing those long tables and uh, replace them with individual uh, student desks. Uh, we'll be able to maintain the, the six feet, uh, minimum of six foot distance and that's going to allow kids to be able to take off their masks and eat, which is an important mask break during the day. Um, as we've done last year, um, Dr. Salas and I will make sure that the kids have a little bit of time at the end to, uh, last year it was uh, a joke session 
with our sixth graders and it actually was the highlight of my day uh, for this year what we're going to look at is using that um, upper field for our kids to get outside and be able to walk move around experience the fresh air um, with the six foot distance to be able to take off their masks and and have that little bit of social time with their friends if, if they're going to be closer than six feet they would have to maintain the masks so our, our lunch will obviously it's going to look a little different but it, it's going to allow kids a mask break it's going to allow kids some safety some outdoor time and we talked about dismissal uh, unless it's an absolute downpour or a snowstorm that we're going to dismiss through the back door walk along the back of the school and then re-enter uh, in the academic hall with the general ed hallways the science, by the science classroom so that even if kids choose to stay in, they'll still have that little bit of break where they can get outside. So it's a different lunch. Our, our, uh, our food service people are setting up grab and go. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's going to look a little bit different, but I, I feel comfortable that in saying that we're going to be able to maintain safety and safe distance and, and not lose sight of the fact that they are still kids and they, they do enjoy one another. One thing I should say, and I didn't mention this in the other two forums, is that we will have uh, lunch available for our fully remote students, anybody who is in that mode, um, because that's appropriate as well. Um, a question about symptom screening. Symptom screening probably should be active. Any progress on a phone app-based affirmative screening process? So the commissioner actually is, in his group is not recommending we do any type of temperature screening uh, at doors, if that's that's kind of a, a, sort of a, a subtext of this question, uh, because of false readings, and there's some data on that in the uh, actual document. The role of the family is crucial in symptom screening, and I want to make that really clear that we're going to be um, by basically coming into the building, you're going to be pledging that you're going to be very adamant and very um, active in looking at your students' health. And of course, our staff will be working with that as well to make sure that if we see symptoms that we're uh, doing, following the proper protocol, bringing that person to the isolated area, that would be a, a, a sick um, place where that person could, could wait safely before uh, he or she was dismissed. Uh, we have looked at some phone-based uh, screening process. Right now, it would be more of just a, um, an affirmation that you were uh, symptom-free and that you were coming symptom-free to school but uh, again, we have to be careful of all kinds of confidentiality uh, information with those apps. So, you know, we're, we're working on it, but uh, like I said, it's, uh, we're gonna be looking for symptoms if they come about and we have a protocol for dealing with it if it does, if it does occur. And we're gonna be asking families to really double down on helping with that. Um, we talked about will students move from class to class. Um, thank you for all of your hard work and dedication. Um, I don't want to give that away here. Oh, just very, just thank you. <laughs> that was very nice. If you if you have sixth grader on the bus and also have an eighth grader, why can't the family members ride together? Uh, simply because we, we don't have the space on the buses right now. And if again, it's a kind of a, it's a tough situation that if you stop making those accommodations, where do you stop? Um, you know, we, we have to abide by the law and we're doing that. And if we go beyond that, how do you equitably determine who can ride a bus and who can't uh, without you know, doubling and tripling our bus fleets? So we, we looked at all that, we're still looking. Nothing's totally sealed yet, but I'm just being honest, that doesn't appear to be a, a thing we're gonna be able to do at this point. Has the idea of mainly academics for the in-person week and mainly extracurricular for remote learning time come up? Well, I'll just answer from a district perspective is that we really, we really invested in our um, educating of the whole child. So um, although with some of the um, specialist subjects do lend themselves very well to multiple modalities, uh, and we're keeping that in mind as we go, uh, we, we certainly don't want to um, value, uh, make a value judgment here. But all of us are looking at the best schedule for our kids overall. I don't know, uh, Principal Mills, if there was any thought that went into that um, kind of balance. Yeah, it, it, we did examine it, but we really came back to um, that commitment to uh, a, a, you know the whole child and full education. Um, you know, there are the absolute you know general education classes are, are, are critical, but to be honest, there are, we have some students who come into school, and the only reason they do is so that they can get you know get to their art class 
or uh, you know, build in STEM or be able to perform in music and be around our music teachers. So uh, in order to support all our kids and you know, to be as, as fully developed as possible, we chose to commit to all our, you know, maintaining all our, our subject areas. Thank you, John. Um, uh, point about eye protection. Eye protection is probably somewhat important in protection against infection. Face shields can also keep, uh, can help keeping, can help, can help keep hands away from mucous membranes and the masks. Consideration of use of face shields. So face shields right now are being uh, recommended as a mitigating factor, but not as you're saying here, but not as a replacement for a, uh, an actual mask. Uh, we do have these ordered for our staff who will be um, more intensively involved in providing services such as a maybe a speech pathologist, for instance, I always give that example because maybe they're closer than um, a person would be typically helping a student. And they actually have quite a lot of what we call PPE or personal protective equipment that includes a gown and a mask and, uh, and a uh, face shield. And uh, so that is, that's provided. Um, we're clearly gonna be, um, we're gonna be careful and be mindful. We do have some ordered, mainly for staff in dealing with uh, uh, situations, but not necessarily exclusively for staff. So we're gonna look at scenarios where that eye protection might be uh, needed. And if, and if that's the case, we'll order more, but we do have, we do have a stock of it. Um, so anyway, that's uh, it's probably my best answer for, for that for now. Uh, if a member of the family tests positive, does the student switch over to remote learning? Um, we, we would follow, again, we'd follow the, the guidance from our health official in town. Um, but if that student is deemed not appropriate to come back to school, then yes, we would be able to afford our, our remote learning situation until it was deemed safe by the health official for that person to, um, to return. Is it possible that students might be in class, in capital letters, if the teacher has decided to teach remotely only, so they will essentially sit in school at desks and watch a Zoom lesson. Oh, we haven't really crossed that yet. I mean, we're gonna have situations with staff and we're gonna to have to deal with that as well. And, and, and you know, they're obviously trying to help, help with anything we can help with. Um, I guess it's a possibility if we had a, uh, but of course you need supervision. You can't, I mean, you can't let a middle schooler alone in a, in a, um, in a room. For sure. So, I mean, you're gonna, you can't let any student alone in a room, for sure. You're gonna have to have supervision there. So we could potentially flip that, but right now we're not looking at that as a, as a way we're gonna go about things. Is there a place to educate outdoors with remote temporary trailers, possibly large tents on the athletic fields? Yeah, like I said, I mean, it's, it, the trailers are, are, first of all, very expensive. Not that that's, you know, we, we're, we're gonna try to look for the best thing we can do, but they're also small comparatively. So you really can't put too many kids in them just as you can't put them in a classroom. Um, and then you have the supervisory aspect of, you know, you're going to be supervising over multiple classrooms. I don't know. We, we looked at that and we don't see how, how beneficial that would be. The large tents, they can be beneficial. We are going to try to get some tents, but again, it's, if you really think about what a class looks like out there with all the accommodations you have to have for students who need, um, need those accommodations, probably not a, uh, a realistic model for a long-term solution. Certainly for breaks, for certain days when the day is appropriate, yeah, that would be good. And we are gonna look at some of those things. But uh, if this question is looking at it as a way of bringing all of our students back, which I'm not sure it is, uh, we don't really see that as a, as a viable model. Um, but yeah, we're gonna use them for sure. And that's a good point. Can we suspend band and chorus to make a longer lunch? A break from the stress for the kids? Maybe the wind instruments are more risky also under the circumstances. So I'll take the back part of that first. Uh, the guidance is very explicit uh, that just came out. And that's the, the guidance, by the way, which I sent you the day after I sent the big document. Uh, it does very much talk about what the social distancing needs to be and safety measures in each of these classes, including wind and brass instruments. And they are more stringent than in other places, uh, other classes. But as far as suspending band and chorus to make a longer lunch, we're not, we're not looking at that at this point. Um, as Principal Mills said, you know, a lot of our students really, uh, that is the break from stress for them. It's to be in, that, in those classes where they're trying to find um, you know, what, what they're about. Uh, so yeah, I don't know, anything you wanna to add to that, Principal Mills? 
No, you said it, uh, you said it well. well um, the, uh, you know, the same could be said, uh, our health and wellness classes, um, it's the same thing. There are some students that, um, you know, really need the, uh, the, 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 the creativity, the, the creative opportunities that art and music presents to them. And there are some students that if it wasn't for a PE class, uh, they, they, you know, um, go a little crazy. They need time to get out and move around. So we're maintaining all of that in our schedule, we'll still be able to maintain a, a 30 minute lunch. Uh, and, and from eating with the kids every day, um, you know, our kids tend to, you know, eat in, in, you know, 12 to 17 minutes. And then I'm confident that they're going to have some time to uh, take advantage of, of the, the field out back and the opportunity to get outside and move around a little bit. Um, I do, I, and I, I totally respect the creativity and thinking outside the box because I think that's really important at this time. Me too. No, I love, they, all of these are great, great, great ideas, great questions. They're very helpful. Um, another question about moving, moving groups, to moving uh, to different classrooms or staying in the same classroom. I think we covered that. Uh, who should we notify if we don't need a bus? Well, this, a survey was sent out to all students K through six outside of two miles. That was the second survey, um, and uh, that you, if you receive that, you you are in that category, and you should um, indeed have answered that. If you don't need a bus, um, you wouldn't need to notify us at all at this stage. Uh, what is the procedure for families who choose to homeschool and not the hybrid or remote? What will you require for families? I'll let Dr. Scollins talk about that because it's a homeschooling question more than a remote learning question. If you, if you are thinking about homeschooling your child, you can email me. I'll send you the paperwork for that. Um, we have a policy from the school committee around, you know, what's the expectation. But um, if you are going to consider homeschooling, you would need to fill out the forms, which really have you explain what curriculum you're going to be using, how you're going to assess your child, what materials and resources you're going to use. Um, that comes into my office and then um, I approve it. Um, or not, or we talk about what, what things need to be added to the program. Um, and at the end of the year, you send in your assessments and, and we um, move your child to the next level or not. But normally it's usually a pretty good process. And um, we don't have a lot, probably about 10 families a year that normally would do homeschooling. Um, what if one child qualifies for busing, but the other does not, i.e. a sixth and an eighth grader? Yeah, I know. This is these are tough answers for me because I, 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 you know, we're at this point we'd only be able to afford the busing to that sixth grader, uh, and that would be something that you'd have to consider in your your plans for the bus uh, for transportation. Um, what happens if a child is sent home with sick with COVID symptoms such as a cough? Does that child take a test before returning to school? Well, they'd be asked to see their health official. Um, with, I mean, their their doctor. And we'd wait, uh, we'd wait for information regarding that. What happens with the remaining students in the meantime? This is, all, this is a little tricky, of course, because you know symptoms that are COVID are not necessarily COVID because they're similar symptoms. We're gonna work with all of our health officials to, to make those determinations um, as, we, as we go. But um, you know, really, it's a, this is more of a medical question that I would, will lean on our nurses and of course, uh, our district doctor, district physician, which by the way, I'm setting up a, a Zoom for families with the district physician, his name Dr. Golden. Some of these questions would be really good for him, but um, we would immediately take cues from our health officials. Will there be the opportunity to see the teachers after school for extra help? Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see why there wouldn't. I mean, it would be on appointment by the teacher, of course, and it would be in the same social distanced uh, way that classes are held. Will buses be free? Buses are free for students who are K to six, correct? Outside of two miles. Thanks for all you're doing. Will, si will class sizes be capped? Well, they will in that we need to fit them in uh, safely, but John, you wanna talk about that? There's actually, just so you know, there, there hasn't been a restriction on spaces and the amount of kids you can put in a space as long as you can physically distance them appropriately. But I'll let John answer the question because I think the hybrid helps a bit. Yeah, we're, we're you know, working on the master schedule uh, and with an eye towards uh, keeping the classes as, as evenly um, uh, 
uh, you know, keep the enrollments uh, even between the sections so that in a hybrid model, we're not looking at, um, you know, one class having, you know, uh, you know, normally 30 or 35 kids. So even in a hybrid situation, there's still too many. Um, we're looking at keeping all, uh, all the numbers down and we would like to keep it at a 12 or 13 uh, in a class. And then the next question is about, and maybe I'm waiting for a question for you, uh, Barbara. I don't know why this one hasn't hit you yet, but um, this isn't fun. <laughs> what tech training uh, will teachers receive? Some really struggle with Zoom. Um, well, one thing I want to mention here is that what we did in the spring, I, I think it's really aptly termed pandemic learning. Uh, that was a term uh, coined by Peter DeWitt, uh, who's a, a really nice instructional leader. And because it was, we, we were trying to, it was changing constantly and we were trying to, we, we weren't prepared for it, as you know, and n nor were, were, was anyone. So this is a much different scenario where we're able to prepare for um, what will happen in remote learning. So um, Dr. Scholars, you wanna talk about any of the training that we're hoping to put in place? Sure. Um, and, you know, I do want to say, too, a lot of teachers are doing a lot of training on their own. Um, there were several teachers involved in some Google training this summer, also Zoom training. I'm getting all sorts of certificates that they just got today on learning how to use Zoom and breakout rooms. So um, so they're doing a lot of it on their own. But we've also created um, and contracted with um, EdTech Teacher, and they are going to provide training for our staff around Google Classroom, um, remote learning, and what does that look like? And how do you work in that kind of environment? And how do you teach in that environment as well as how do you create and design lessons that are engaging for students within that world? It's just, it is very different. It's not the same as if you're in a classroom. So um, we'll be working, we have those scheduled and um, we'll continue that throughout the year because you know we wanna kind of front load things if we can as much as possible. But once you get into it, you're going to have more questions. So um, we're working with the IT committee and also the uh, professional development committee to kind of think about what kinds of things do teachers really need. We just sent them a survey and we're going to meet tomorrow morning and look at the data to see what additional things do they need, um, not just in technology, but obviously you can imagine there's a lot of desire to have some more technology. Yeah. So thank you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Barbara a quick question because I know there's a lot of people will have this. Is can you um, Barbara? Can you talk a little bit about IEPs and how we will work with students um, on individual education plans as we move into a hybrid model? Sure. So um, you know when when we were in the spring and we were in that pandemic learning, um, a lot of the support that you got was kind of like resources and support in addition to some real um, you know, services and learning. And this time around, the plans are going to be much more robust. They are going to be service and learning plans, um, you know, much like the learning that Mr. Mills has talked about has been, you know, real scheduled learning, you know, following the class schedule, things like that. Um, special ed services are all going to be upheld. So whatever services are on the IEP, they will be delivered. Now, sometimes they will be delivered live, the student is in the cohort that is in school at the time. Some of them may be delivered synchronously. Some of them may be delivered asynchronously. Um, but those services will be delivered. And that is something that, you know, has come from the guidance from the state, something that we are very committed to. And, um, you know, you can feel confident that that is going to be happening. Thank you, Barbara. I know that was probably down there later. So we're, about, we're actually over time, but I, I'm going to do just kind of a little speed round of some of the questions here. Um, and then we'll, we'll end in just a moment. Um, but again, you can always email me or Principal Mills or any of us if you have specific questions. Will there be, uh, the, this is a question about just from that same person, but um, she has a, a student or he is a student in sixth and eighth grade. The surname begins with M. Will our girls be on the same rotation or potentially separate weeks? At the middle school? Yeah, you don't have to tip your hat to uh, from it. We're, we're about, we're going to be getting that out in the next couple of weeks anyway, but um, I guess the idea is will siblings of the middle school be on the same, same uh, schedule? Yes. Yep. Okay. Will there be MCAS in 2021? Right now it's planned, although there's a lot of chatter about that, so we will see. Just confirming sixth graders will be one week on, one week off like the rest of the middle school, but will have bus services, correct? Mm -hmm. Sixth yeah. graders outside of a two mile radius 
from the school and they'll be on the same schedule, yes. And can, can we, I know it's part of the speed round, but I do want to point out for people that um, with only the sixth graders taking um, the buses to school and the morning being, you know, a, a bustling time for families that we're looking at having the middle school drop off occur at the front of the school. Um, we're only gonna have two buses coming in and out. So our middle school parents who are dropping off will be able to pull up the main driveway, uh, go to the left by the auditorium, drop off at the end of the, you know, the, right by the entrance to the middle school and then loop around and, and depart that way. If you've got a middle schooler and a high schooler, um, the high school is dropping off at the back the way we did it last year. Your choice, you can drop off at either door. Uh, we're happy to have a high schooler come in or if you wanna leave your middle schooler in the back, I would say whichever line is shorter, um, that's fine. And we're gonna have protocols for how we enter the building, masks if needed for students at the building. And of course, there's already hand sanitizer all over the place put up on walls and on the buses, just so you know, already. Um, okay, uh, about changing classes, we got that. Will middle school students stay with the same group of 10 to 12 kids throughout the whole day? John? No, well, they'll be mixed between classes. So each class will have 10 or 12 kids, but then those will mix a little as they go from one class to another. You, you right. might be with a friend in, in uh, your math class at the end of the period. You go to Spanish, she goes to French. So there is a little bit um, of, of change that way. Um, I'm just looking at these questions. I think we've hit all, almost all of them. What will lunch look like? What, uh, are they switching classes, staying in the same class? How does lunch, what will the lunchroom look like? Will standardized testing occur? We talked about that. Um, some ideas about remote, additional detail on remote classes. Will there be pre-recorded lectures and meetings with teachers? Kind of a little of, a little of both. Both, probably. Yep. Um, Last spring is a challenge working remote for students because they had information in different areas of Google Classroom, but it'd be possible to have an online agenda so the teachers can add classwork and links for each student. And yeah, I and mean, we're gonna be looking at and making our, that's part of the robust model where, it, where no matter what we do, it's gonna mirror the school day. And that's at all level, all levels, I should say. We're really mirroring the school day as opposed to in that pandemic learning, we, were, we weren't doing that. Um, Required use lockers, we talked about it. I think we got most of them. All right, well at that point, um, we went a little bit over, but I think it was worth it. Hopefully we answered somebody's question that we may not have gotten to. And um, I wanna thank uh, Principal Mills, um, Barbara, our new uh, Director of Student Services, thank you. And of course, Dr. Scollins, thank you. And thank you all out there for everything you do. Make class a, a wonderful place. We promise we'll keep working diligently and we'll keep safety at the forefront. You know, we're not done listening and we're not done planning. So this is a really important step along the way. So thank you all, have a wonderful night and um, talk to you soon.